to episode 126 of the Various and Sundry podcast. I am your host, Matt Harmon, joined live from the Vault Studio on the beautiful campus of Grace College and Theological Seminary by my good friend, my colleague, my co-host, and the man who, as of next week, will have a new job, John Two, two weeks. Scott two weeks. Sloat. Two weeks. It's like uh, two, in a, two in a couple days. Yeah. So this is one of the things we've been teasing, sort yeah, of. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I start yeah. a new job. Uh, Tell us I, about it. Well, I'm, I'm still at Grace, so I'm still at the college and seminary here. Yeah, that's big news because that's, you know, keeping you around was, was, a, was a priority. Yes, yes. And just for listeners out there who maybe aren't in, informed on that issue, uh, it's not that I have been a diva in demanding more things from the college and seminary. Well... <laughs> <laughs> wow. Um, it's not a diva, but you've been eager to see your role yes. expand in the in the institution. Because it because it's been grant funded. Yeah. My my current role. Yeah. So grant money runs out, oh, in a in a year or so. And so wanted to want to do I have a job was, was really the question. And the answer is yes. So I start as the director of development uh, in middle of June. Yes. OK. So for those who may not be familiar with the, the world of higher education, explain what a director of development does. Yeah. So a director of development uh, travels around, engages with alumni, donors, those sorts of things, and, uh, and helps align their resources with Projects of Grace. OK. And uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, another aspect of that role will be you will continue to do something that you did in this current role, which is work on grants. Yes, yes. So I will uh, continue to probably shepherd and and help other people write grants more than write them myself. Yeah. I think I'll certainly have a big hand in that, but hopefully expanding that out to m- more than just the seminary. So helping the humanities write a grant for mm-hmm. XYZ, helping yeah. the sciences write a grant for XYZ, stuff like that. OK. Yes. So um, that, that's very exciting. And, and that's something that, – that grant piece of it is a skill and an interest that has developed over the last few years. Oh, oh absolutely. That you've been a part of writing grants, multiple grants for different things. Yeah. And the weirdest part, I keep getting them. That's, that's <laughs> the weirdest part. I think I'm batting like 900 or something when it comes to grant writing. So – yeah. It's been it's been a really exciting almost like sometimes when I write these grants I feel like a dog that's caught the bumper of a car <laughs> and and like how did I get this? Yeah. This 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 should outpace me at at some level. So yeah. Very thankful, very excited. Yes. And I get to start that oh in in the middle of June sometime. Okay. And the good news for the podcast is that means that you're still around. We're still going to be able to record. Yeah, Though it might yeah. Uh, it might cause some scheduling conflicts. scheduling challenges for us recording. So we'll we'll, we'll cross Absolutely. those bridges when we when we yeah, get we'll to f- them. We'll figure it out. Yes. So, well, if you would like to contact the show and uh, offer up your resources to align with our <laughs> institutional policies. Yeah, do you like how I said college. that? Yeah. yeah. I, I know the speak. I, I, yeah. I know the speak. You're already picking up the language. You can contact the show at Twitter on Twitter at VNS Pod. Email the show, various and sundry podcast at gmail.com. We are on Facebook. We're on YouTube, various and sundry podcast. And we would love for you to uh, leave a review and a five-star rating. And we had a new one that just uh, came in this past week from a yeah. – we're, we're putting pieces together. Mm-hmm. We, we had a new listener reach out to us. Um, so we wanted to give him a shout out. Which we love it when lis- when new love listeners yeah, that's great. reach out to us. Yeah. It's always a lot of fun. So yeah. we've exchanged a few emails. And yeah. So shout out time. to Randy in Tennessee. Uh, yeah. Good to have you on board. And uh, appreciate you reaching out to us and then going on to leave a review. So uh, let's talk some sports. Let's do it. OK. Uh, not a ton going on. The NBA finals are set mm-hmm. and it's going to be the Boston Celtics and the Golden State Warriors, which um, 
I, I'm relieved. I didn't want the Heat to make the finals. Why didn't you want the Heat to make the finals? I, I don't like the fi- I don't like the the Heat. Okay, and I think just their style of play, I think, would make for a less entertaining hmm. finals than Celtics and Warriors. I think it'll be uh, more uh, up tempo and just more uh, aesthetically pleasing hmm. to have Celtics and Warriors. And do you have a pick in the final? Uh, sadly, I think the Warriors will probably win. Okay, this is a no-win situation because I don't really like either of these teams. No, no, I don't. I don't either. Uh, yeah. So I, I know uh, Lee in Indiana is a big Celtics fan, so he will not appreciate us rooting against his Celtics. But yeah, how do you end up a Celtics fan in Indiana? I, th- there's I actually vaguely remember part of the backstory to that. He's, okay. t- he's told me before. I've asked for a new uh, Twitter <laughs> load thread on how how. His, I'll ask and you shall you know, receive. Yeah, okay. So um prediction on the series? Um so I don't like I don't like the Celtics at all. Uh, I'm probably more of a I'd probably root for the Golden State Warriors. So I'll I'll probably say Golden State in six. Okay. Um did you catch any of game seven between Celtics and Heat on Sunday? Just some highlights. Okay. Have you followed any of the kind of buzz about Jimmy Butler choosing to shoot the three with down two with like 18 seconds left. No, no. I saw that highlight um, okay. and that he missed. But Yeah. Um, yeah. There's been some you know buzz about that of was that a good shot? Was it not a good shot? Had a little disagreement with my son last night about that mm. very issue. Which Talk. side were you on? I think it was a terrible shot. OK. He's like a – I think for the series, he's like an 18 percent three-point shooter. Hmm. That's not his strength. Yeah, and I know he's your best player, and yeah, great. His skill is getting to the rim, mm-hmm. or even getting to a mid range. I, I think from a basketball perspective, that was a poor decision. Hmm. So anyway, but worked out for me because I didn't want to see the Heat win. So, um, I actually watched a little hockey last night. Did you Rangers? Uh, yeah, it uh, wasn't the most riveting, Carolina, but but it was competition and it was on. So. I do love playoff hockey when I do get to watch it. Yeah. It's it's a pretty intense it is. It uh, is high pace high pace game. I mean it's hockey's interesting because like you go on for like two minutes at a time and you're just one hundred percent for yeah. two minutes. And then you come off. Right. And somebody else goes on and goes one hundred percent for two minutes. And that's that can be pretty exciting. Yeah. Yeah hockey's just a different just a different breed altogether. Mm-hmm. The kind of athletes you get, the mentality of it, the strategy, it's just – it's its own entity. I, I'm not a big on television hockey fan in terms of watching, but going to a hockey oh, game yeah. in person, lots of fun. Oh, yeah. Lots of fun. OK. Uh, tell us about your Mets. They're great. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Um, so we're trying to – we're trying to uh, make our way through some injuries to our pitching staff right now. Looks like middle, late June, our pitching staff will be back for the most part, uh, certainly by the All-Star break. Okay. But, r- but right now, we're nine and a half games up on the next closest competitor in our division. All right. That's pretty darn good. That That's that's a substantial lead after two months of the season. Yeah. I mean, we're, we're flying pretty high right now. So – Okay. Um, Do you want to knock on the wood table we're recording on here? There we go. Yeah. Uh, so it, it's been it's been a lot of fun to watch. Uh, they are playing a different brand of baseball than everybody else, it feels like. So it feels like what's happened over the last 10, 15 years in baseball is like everybody's home run or bust. Right. Where the Mets are now like, we just want to hit singles. And it makes a fun brand of baseball to watch where they're just poking singles through – hitting line drives into the outfield and just creating momentum that way. Yeah. So that's been a lot of fun. There is something to be said for um, when when there are trends in in sports, like I think especially of basketball, you know, the, the big trend ha- over the last, you know, eight to ten years has been, OK, you want to – post play is gone. It's spread the floor, drive and kick. Threes or layups basically. That's yeah. it. No mid-range game, nothing like that. And what some teams eventually figure out is um, 
Well, we have no chance of winning like that because there are better versions of that already out there, like the Warriors, for example. Like, mm-hmm. So some teams, I think, are finally starting to figure out maybe – our best path to winning is doing something different mm-hmm. so that it's a change up to play against. So, uh, it well, seems- it's kind of like it's kind of like the Ravens uh goodness with uh, Lamar Jackson where they're going to run the ball, you know, uh 30, 35 times. Yeah, so, and only pass 10 or 12. Yeah. Uh, and people going, I had to dust off my play, uh, my defensive playbook from like the 90s or right. something like that. Right. Uh, but yes, so the Mets are taking the shift, like everybody's shifting to one side and the guys are just trying to hit the ball where the people are not. Like they're hitting yeah. like just ground balls basically into those spaces. Yeah. And – Seems to be working for them. They're batting like – yeah, they, they have some guys that are bat- batting like 330, 340, 350. Yeah. I mean just ridiculous numbers. Right. So it's been it's been a lot of fun to watch. Good deal. Good deal. All right. Uh, at this point, it's good for us to remind you that next episode that will drop on June 7th, we will begin our discussion of our summer read, Randy Newman, Mere Evangelism, 10 Insights from C.S. Lewis to Help You Share Your Faith. We can throw a link to it in the show notes on Absolutely. Amazon. It's not hard to find. It's a it's a pleasant read. It's uh, very engaging. Randy's a good writer. And so uh, if you want to keep track of where we're at, we will be discussing the introduction and the first three chapters mm-hmm. next week. So I encourage you to pick that up. And um, yeah, I, I, I'm, in, I'm excited to talk to – we're going to interview Randy coming up in a few weeks. That episode won't air until uh, July 4th week. But so, but I'm excited. Randy is a, uh, is a very engaging person, great sense of humor. Um, if there's – if I could only pick one person in the world to, talk, to teach me about evangelism, it would be Randy Newman. Really? Yes. Hmm. So – uh, yeah, so make, make sure you check that out. Ready to talk about our main topic for the day? Uh, sure, okay. sure. Let's do it. Um, and we're starting we're starting to read that book next week, right? Next episode, we next will have episode. our our initial discussion. Okay, yeah, one to three intro and one intro to and one to three. That's right. not really a lot, and it reads quickly. So okay, all right, John. What is our topic for this week? So we have a, a I, don't, I don't know how to describe this, something a little bit more history focused and culturally focused at the same time. And yeah, yeah it's a little weird. So we're uh, discussing, uh, well, really, really two things. There's a Gospel Coalition article mm-hmm. uh, written by Thomas Kidd, and it's kind of commemorating. He's one of your boys. You're he big, is. You're a big Thomas Kidd fan. I'm a big Thomas Kidd fan. Can and we call him Tommy K? We've got Timmy K. Oh, Can Timmy we go K with Tommy, Tommy K? K? I like it. Okay. Uh, uh, so he wrote an article kind of not commemorating, but reevaluating a sermon done a hundred years ago yeah. by uh, Harry Emerson Fosdick. Yes. Uh, and he gave a sermon uh, in the 20s, uh, 1922, yeah. called Shall the, is it Shall the, uh, mm-hmm. where's the Shall title? the Fundamentalist Win? Shall the Fundamentalist Win? Uh, and we'll outline this a little bit further, but uh, he is not a fundamentalist, <laughs> and he is uh, not the, a the fan. obvious. The obvious answer he's hoping for is God, no. <laughs> yeah, uh, and so Kid is like trying to do an evaluation of this, like a hundred years later, like yeah, who won, who didn't win, and yeah. Uh, so yeah, let's. Should we start with the sermon itself? Uh, yeah, I think we probably just need to give a little bit of historical context before we talk maybe about the sermon itself. So. Uh, so Fosdick was a um, a pastor in New York City. Yep, and um, he was a leading advocate of what uh, we we could refer to as um, as liberal Christianity, liberal Protestantism, mm-hmm. essentially, in which um, the emphasis was less on uh, doctrine and more on uh, we should be about helping people. Uh, one of their kind of catchphrases was um, uh, the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of all men. Hmm. 
And the idea is that really the central thrust of the Christian religion should not be arguments about um, issues of theology like the atonement or the virgin birth or scripture, but we just need to love people and try to help people and care for them. Um, and that actually doctrine gets in the way of that. Mm -hmm. uh, so he was one of the leading proponents of what uh, what we call sort of liberal Protestantism. So that's kind of the the, the larger context of that. Um, and uh, in response to that, um, a group of conservative people, uh, conservative theologically conservative mm -hmm. people, came out with a series of books uh, called the, the fundamentals, fundamentals. Yeah. Uh, that defended things like the virgin birth, substitutionary mm -hmm. atonement, yep. things like that. Yeah, for sure. And so uh, there's a sense in which uh, – well, uh, we can talk about the sermon now, I think. So the, the sermon itself, he, he kind of divides uh, Christians into two camps, mm -hmm. the fundamentalists and the modernists. So the fundamentalists uh, – we should probably distinguish that he's using that term maybe a little bit differently than what we think of the term fundamentalist today. Yeah, uh, because I, I think when we use the term fundamentalist in in conversation today, it tends to have the additional connotation of separatism, separatism and legalism. Yes, yeah, and that's not what he has in view. Mm -hmm. he, he is he is arguing against what we would today refer to essentially as kind of traditional evangelical Christianity mm -hmm. essentially. Um, and so fundamentalists are people who believe in the inerrancy of scripture, substitutionary atonement, that the miracles of the Bible actually happened, those sorts of things. And the modernists, which he would lump himself into, were people who believed that traditional Christian beliefs needed updating or adapting in light of uh, modern science in particular. We have all this new information. We have yeah. all this new research. It's time to update the Christian faith. Exactly. Exactly. So th those are the sort of two camps that he's identifying. And they, these two groups were in essence engaged in a struggle for uh, control of influence in – Major denominations. Sure. So, you, uh, in particular, in his context, he's talking primarily about Presbyterians and Baptists. Mm -hmm. um, and he went back and forth between the two. Yeah. <laughs> which which blows my mind, <laughs> right? That that he could he could be on one hand a Presbyterian and then or start as a, start out as a Baptist and then go to the Presbyterian Church. Well, I you know, suppose you, that's you, you sprinkle a baby one week, you, you you dunk an adult next week. I met somebody the other day remain nameless, uh, <laughs> was a pastor of a Presbyterian church and he talked about the process of finding a new job and said, well, I realized I could go here, I could go here. And he was starting to name Presbyterian denominations and then goes, I could also go Reformed Baptist. I went, hold the phone. <laughs> <laughs> like, like I always understood those lines as pretty stark, um, but he did not and so – him and Fosdick are blowing my mind. <laughs> OK. Gotcha. Just on that area, let yeah. alone his yeah. sermon. Yeah. OK. So you ready to talk about the sermon itself? Sure. OK. Um, you you want to give some <clears throat> some insights on the sermon itself here to start with? Yeah. Well, he outlines it um, based on Acts chapter 5 where you have uh, Peter and the apostles arguing with or discussing with or however you want to put it. Uh, having a conversation with sort of the Jewish leaders of the day um, and how the modernists represent sort of the apostles, sort of their new understanding of yeah. Jesus and those sorts of things. They're the innovators. They're oh, the, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. They're the ones bringing about change right. uh, in how the uh, Jewish leaders uh, in Acts 5 represent the fundamentalists, these people who are stodgy, don't want to change, yeah. difficult – um, and, and are more in love with the way things used to be than how they're changing to. Yeah, yeah. So he uses it as, as a bit of a framing device. Um, By the way, very short sermon here. Uh, yeah, I mean – Eight pages printed? That's yeah. 25 minutes? Uh, maybe. 
Um, so, he, so he uses that as a framing device to get into this question of uh, will we allow will we allow or sit by as the fundamentalists seek to kick people like us modernists out mm-hmm. of denominations and and that sort of thing. Uh, and then he highlights several issues where he feels like we've got to be changing some of these beliefs. He talks about the inspiration of the Bible. He talks about um, – uh, let's see. He talks about the second coming. Mm-hmm. Uh, he talks about uh, substitutionary atonement. Um so those are some of the some of the things that he highlights as yeah th- these are some areas where we we just got to be updating yeah what we believe in light of modern science and 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 such so and um what's uh what's what's striking to me in in some ways is uh although although our 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 contemporary context is very different the impulse to say if Christianity is going to survive, we have to update it in light of contemporary issues or mm-hmm. contemporary concerns is uh, something that has been present throughout the history of the church. Yeah. So, But we can talk a little bit about that more down the road. I, I want to get to um, – uh, I had a quote here I wanted to pull out. Fundamentalists uh, – uh, the, actually, this is a quote from the uh, – so this is a quote from the Thomas Kidd article that was trying to kind of summarize this. Um, well, let's, ah, let's skip that. Let's just skip that. There's just too much to deal with here. Um, th- other thoughts on the sermon itself? Or you want to move on to just kind of how, how that played out historically in terms of – who won? Who didn't? Yeah, let's uh, let's go let's go to the art to the Gospel Coalition article. Okay, I think I think Thomas Kidd does a as usual. Yeah, does a good job. Yeah, of, you can uh, always count on Tommy K to to come through on these things. <laughs> yes, um, yes. So he manages to kind of lay out the issues, and and this was uh, the article itself was commemor in one sense commemorating the one hundredth anniversary of giving mm-hmm. that sermon. If you scroll to the end of the of the article by Thomas Kidd, there are two other links to an article by Kevin DeYoung and then an article by another person that I'm, whose name I'm forgetting off the top of my head that uh, further explore uh, that situation. But um, yeah, so how what were what was some of the fallout from from I mean. You want to be careful about putting too much weight on one sermon, but like, let's kind of talk about the fallout that came in light of this sermon as an expression of this, this sort of movement, this modernist movement. For for Fosdick personally, uh, we we can start there, but I was thinking more big picture of developments within Christianity. But let's start with Fosdick. Well, Fo- Fosdick, um, apparently a year and, – and I, I did not know this, but Fosdick uh, lost his job at that church in, in a little over a year, basically over this sermon. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and then went to uh, another church in New York City, uh, Riverside, which I think – I'm pretty sure is a famous church and was funded by Rockefeller. OK. Which is, which is fascinating to me. Yeah. I mean – Yes and no. I mean, guys like Rockefeller and Vanderbilt and those people—they were and Carnegie. Yeah, they were. They were. They viewed religion as a uh, as a helpful force to teach morals, mm-hmm. so that you know society could function properly. Um, but they they not only funded people like Fosdick, they also funded fundamentalists, right? But to me, I think. My sense I, – I could be wrong. My sense is more that they were perhaps not as aware of some of the finer differences between someone like a, hmm. a, 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 a Fosdick or a, an evangelical church kind of thing. They're like, well, their churches, they're probably doing good. Sure. But that's my sense. I could be wrong. Okay. Um, 
So yeah, this this sermon ended up costing him his job. Um, what about I was I was gonna take this kind of the bigger picture historically speaking. Um, what were some of the outcomes historically speaking uh, within the the, the law, within Christianity in general in the United States in particular as a result of the sort of modernist fundamentalist? Well, I mean, I mean. One thing is we, we don't have we don't have a ton of modernists around today. Uh, we don't this this sort of what became known later I think later as the mainline Protestant denominations. Mm-hmm. They're not around uh, quite as much. Yeah, I mean, part of the answer to the question of shall the fundamentalists win, it, part of it's complicated by the fact that in the immediate aftermath, say in the twenty to thirty years. After mm-hmm. this, uh, when it comes to power and influence within what we come to know as mainline denominations, the modernists won, hands down, hmm. hands down. And in terms of control within, you know, power structures of denominations, and even um, uh, it was pointed out within the sort of religious academy, oh, hands yeah. down. Oh, the yeah. modernist one, and it was not even close. It was a thoroughgoing route in well, those contexts. Well, any divinity school you look at, whether it's Princeton or Yale or you know, p- pick your Duke. Oh yeah, Duke, uh, uh, University of Chicago, Harvard, obviously, Harvard, Yale, obviously, yeah, um, all your Ivy leagues. Uh, all of those, uh, I think, to this day, still would would hold up a more a more modernist. Uh, oh yes, approach. If not, if not a full uh, removal of Christianity in and of itself. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, it's so yeah, from from that aspect, the the modernists did win convincingly. Yeah, and yet the irony is when it comes to um, those denominations, they're dying, mm-hmm. significantly dying, in terms of people. In those denom- in the what we think of as mainline denominations, whereas those that stayed within the sort of the fundamentalist into the neo evangelical evangelical stream, those have seen significant growth mm-hmm. since that time period. Yeah, yeah. So it's one of those interesting dynamics where you've got well, if you ask the question who won, it depends on what what. Uh, battleground you're looking at. Oh, yeah. Um, and, and I thought it was interesting. I was thinking about this. Most of these denominations, most of these mainline denominations had footholds, particularly in the Northeast. Mm-hmm. Uh, and a lot of those places we see today are, are really gutted of uh, good gospel preaching churches today. Yes. And part of what's ironic is one of the main impulses of the of, of this modernist movement was we have to update Christianity if it's going to survive. Mm-hmm. So they went ahead and updated their version of it and their version died. Yeah. Whereas the version that was not updated has sur- not only survived but thrived numerically in some ways mm-hmm. at the sort of common man level, not in the academy, not necessarily in denominational power structures. But when it comes to the kind of the ordinary person on the street, it, it was a decisive route for the fundamentalists in this sense. Well, and it led – I know we're using fundamentalist and evangelical almost interchangeably. Historically speaking, at that point, yes. 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 At the point that Fosdick is talking about, yes, they um, are essentially equivalent. Uh, it did lead some – Fundamentalist leaders to start new institutions. Yes, um, to leave some of the Princetons and mm-hmm. and uh, go out and start Westminster, for example, with uh, uh, M- Machen. Machen, yes. Yep. Uh, and, who, who and, by the way, wrote short. I think his famous book, Christianity and Liberalism, mm-hmm. was published. I think a year after Fosdick's sermon. Oh, really? Yes, 20, mm. 1923. And we've got a link to it in the. Uh, in the in the notes here, we'll we'll make sure we get that in the show notes. But um, so yeah, and and that is still a classic. That you might 
it's like, oh, well, that's about what's going on in the 1920s. No, 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 no. It is, but it's one of those timeless classic books hmm. that's well worth reading now. Hmm. Anyway, I'm sorry I interrupted you. You were kind of search fundamentalists started their own institutions. Yeah, and I mean that's that's where we get a lot of our Christian institutions today. Um, yeah, uh, even denominations. And it, in particular, if you start to look at seminaries, mm -hmm. you know, evangelical seminaries, a lot of them end up having their origins around around this time period. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Uh, Grace Seminary comes up during this time period also. 1937. 37. Uh, Westminster comes up during this time period as we just mentioned. Uh, I'm almost certain Dallas as came well up during this comes time up during this time period. Mm -hmm. so. so yeah, it becomes a, a pivotal – I don't know if sorting is the right word. But mm -hmm. there, there is a there is a big sort that happens here. Yeah, and, and part of what's interesting historically speaking is you – so you have this split, fundamentalist and modernist. And then um, in those kind of couple of decades after this, you, you start to get the split between what we think of as fundamentalists today mm -hmm. and evangelicals. This sort of and, and that that pivoted on the issue of to what extent should we try to engage the world? Yeah. And the fundamentalists were like, been there, done that, got burned, we're done. Mm -hmm. And the sort of evangelicals, neo-evangelicals were like, I think we should make an effort. Mm -hmm. And that's where you start to get some of that split between what we think of as fundamentalists today and more uh, what we think of as evangelicals, yeah. historically speaking. So um, yeah, I, I think it's it, it's one of those interesting dynamics um, to, to think about when it comes to um, – Kid, Kid also made the interesting point that uh, in missionary efforts, the fundamentalists sent out a lot of missionaries in, yeah. in foreign missions or even church planting uh, that the modernists never did, right? Um, and therefore won that battleground as well. Yeah. So, um, it, I think part of what makes this an interesting discussion is getting back at that impulse of. If Christianity is going to survive, we have to update it in light of you know contemporary sensibilities, contemporary you know scientific oh yeah uh, consensus, etc. Um, and so it, that's that's something you still hear. You hear it every day in one sense, but um, you know it, it takes different forms. So you know, twenty years ago, it was the emerging church. Oh yeah, we have to update this and that, and all the old ways are wrong. And 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 I think part of what gets tricky in those conversations is those uh, those movements are often hitting on something that is a legitimate weakness mm -hmm. within the church, within the evangelical church, but their proposed solution is so egregiously wrong yeah. that that it can be hard for us as evangelicals, I think, to to hear the point of critique and go, yeah, yeah, that's a weakness we need to address. Mm -hmm. Because the proposed solution is so off kilter, so off the map in terms of like being unbiblical, unfaithful to uh to the gospel, that you, you just sort of dismiss both of them. Like, well, see, just throw it all away. As opposed to hearing the legitimate, you know, maybe we need to think about are there better ways we can engage certain kinds of people? Are there better ways we can engage certain issues while still remaining faithful mm -hmm. to uh, to the Bible? And that seems to be, a, you know, I think we could speak pretty broadly about this, but that's a that's a problem with criticism broadly today. Is if there's if there's well, in this organization, this thing needs to be tweaked or in this organization, this needs to change or in this institution, something needs to be reformed. The, the criticism is often followed by with – followed by a burn it to the ground or, yeah. or, or make wild changes that are just going to change everything. Mm -hmm. um, however, that doesn't make, mean the criticism isn't, isn't totally – 
useless. It's the solution that seems to be uh, out of step. Right. Or or that even th- the criticism might be um, overdone, mm-hmm. meaning they might have legitimately hit on an issue that they have blown up into this is like the apocalypse. Yes. As opposed oh, to – totally agree. Um, well, no, that – that's a legitimate criticism, but it's not nearly as significant as you seem to be portraying it. Um, so I think sometimes there, there's a lack of proportionality in view mm-hmm. thereof. Yeah, that's a problem. Yeah. As opposed to, well, if you don't see that this is basically the end of the world problem, then we have I, I have no I, I have no idea what to do with you. Yeah. Um, I will say that's not what Fosdick's doing. <laughs> no, no. Uh, things that he is pointing out are not problems. Correct. Correct. Um, yeah, I mean it, it's also interesting. In 1922 when the sermon is given, they've just come through World War I mm-hmm. where the, the level of, of devastation, destruction, loss of life, the scope of warfare – that had never been seen before in the history of the world. And so there's this reaction of what can we do to try to make sure that never happens again? And of course, um, though that's where some of the, the disagreements of, well, we need to do – need to be more active in social programs and that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. That's where it's really at. That's where the kingdom of God's really going to show up is creating this new social reality. And the fundamentalists are like, um, well, the, the human heart's the issue mm-hmm. and we need to make sure that we're communicating the gospel because that's what's going to change human hearts. And, it, and th- there's a distinction right there that will – that will be with us I think until Jesus returns. Mm-hmm. That yeah. conflict between is the primary problem, well, we just need to fix society or we need to – you know preach the gospel and see human hearts converted and and just to be clear those don't need to be mutually exclusive options. Oh yeah. The a, a holistic biblical approach is a both and on that mm-hmm. with the priority of proclamation of the gospel. Um so yeah, I think uh those are some things to keep in mind there. But I I think we need to move on. I think you're right. Yeah. Um like I said we'll have some resources in there the articles that we uh, referred to as well as a link to Fosdick's sermon. If you yeah. want to go ahead and read yep. that, it's a PDF. Um, so yeah, let's uh, let's put a put a bow on that and move on to today in sports history. All right, May thirty first today in sports history, uh, nineteen twenty seven. Uh, Tigers first baseman Johnny Noon, sure, uh, makes an unassisted triple play. That's impressive. That is impressive. One happened just a couple of years ago. Yeah, I I don't know the numbers, but I think there's probably been like ten of those in yeah, the history of baseball. Yeah. Uh, Nineteen eighty three, thirty uh, seventh NBA championship. The Sixers sweep the Lakers in four games. That's I think the first NBA finals I have a actual memory of. Really? Yeah. So I'd have been you know almost ten years old at that okay. point. Dr. J. I was a big Dr. J mm. fan. I mean, who wouldn't be? Yeah, uh, I mean. Uh, oh, uh, 2002, the New Jersey Nets. <laughs> yes. Defeat the Celtics 96-88 in game six of the NBA Eastern Conference Championship, winning the series four games to two to advance to their first NBA Finals playoffs. Yeah, that was the um, – Who'd they face? I believe the Lakers. Yeah, that sounds right. Kobe Shaq? Um. Yeah. Would have got yeah, gotta be yeah. right. Yeah. Okay. Who was uh, was Jason Kidd on that team? Oh yeah, Jason Kidd, Richard Jefferson. Uh huh. Um. The was only it, reason I remember those two is because they had commercials with Jason Kidd talking about he could see out of the he had eyes in the back of his head, <laughs> and he tells Richard <laughs> Jefferson that his car is being stolen <laughs> yeah. or towed or, or something yeah. like that. Yeah. Um, 2008, Usain Bolt breaks the world record in the 100-meter sprint with a uh, wind legal uh, 1.7 meter per second. Uh, I don't know what that means. So uh, his time was 9.72 seconds. Okay. That The thing in the parentheses there, 
means that I can't remember the cutoff, but as long as the wind is under a certain point, it counts as a legitimate world record. So that is saying the wind was at 1.7 meters per second, which, you know, I'm American. I, I, I don't do metric, so I don't know what, how fast that is, yeah. like miles per hour. But as long as the wind is is less than a certain point, it counts as a legitimate hmm. world record. You know, if you ran with a 20 mile an hour wind behind you, it doesn't count. Sure. As a world record. Hmm. So, okay. All right. Um, what do you got? Hmm. I don't know. Uh, we haven't done much track and field, so Usain Bolt feels like a big deal. Okay. I think he still holds the record. Yes, though it's lower than what he's got there at nine point seven. Because he broke his own record. Yeah. Sub ten seconds for 100, 100 meters. Yeah. I think the record's now like 9.5 something. Like My it's goodness. just in, – yeah, it's insane. You want to go with, with Bolt? Yeah, and he's an interesting athlete just because he's so tall. Yes. What is he, 6'4"? Six, six, uh, I would guess so. Traditionally, sprinters tend to be shorter. Historically speaking, yeah. And uh, he's he's not like that, which – but part of that explains why if you watch him race typically for the first like – 20 to 30 meters, he's not in front mm-hmm. because he's got those long strides that take him a little bit to get going. But once he starts going, those long strides just consume distance like nobody oh, else. Oh, yeah. All right. So we'll go with uh, Usain Bolt. One thing you liked. OK. Well, making this up on the fly, <laughs> uh, I I may have mentioned it before. I can't remember. But uh, I just finished C.S. Lewis biography by Alistair McGrath. And it was very, very good. Okay. I really enjoyed it. OK. Uh, I, too, am making it up on the fly. Nice, nice. Yes, I noticed the, the – Good, good the, quality radio right here. Yeah. Um, so I am going to go with um, – my wife and I this weekend watched – this is on Amazon Prime. Uh, it's called Lula Rich. It is the story of uh, Lula Row, the Lula Row company. Have you heard mm-hmm. of this? So they were like huge in terms of uh, selling leggings and these like kind of colorful prints. And they're basically basically multi-level marketing that was a pyramid scheme. And so uh, the documentary kind of tracks their growth and then shows how it's kind of fallen apart and interviews inside people. It's just – it's fascinating. Hmm. Basically, they had um, – you know, they 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 marketed this to stay at home moms and you know women who want to work part time but have a uh, full time income and uh, and the the founders of it they're Mormon so there's some weird like kind of Mormon theology that kind of dips in mm. at points and just yeah it's just fascinating so if if you like the sort of uh, rise and fall narrative kind of thing. It's called Lula Rich, and it is on Amazon Prime. Nice. All right. We have talked about John's new job. Yeah. Con- congratulations again. Thank you. I will expect you to now be raising money for my uh, bonuses coming up this <laughs> next few years. So uh, we have talked about our summer read. Reminder, next episode, we will be discussing chapters – Uh, The intro in chapters one to three of Randy Newman's book, Mere Evangelism. We have talked about shall the fundamentalists win? And we basically concluded it depends. It depends, yes. (laughs) Uh, We talked about Usain Bolt. We talked about um, an interesting documentary series that I watched on Amazon Prime. We talked about a C.S. Lewis biography. So I think by definition – We have covered our various and sundry topics, and so all that's left to say is, until next time, the Lord bless y'all real good. Later. Later.